Hey everyone, it's Nolan, and this is going to be part two of our video series on rocket engine design and fundamentals. And so in part one, we talked about the fundamental concepts of thrust and combustion. And in this video, we'll talk more about the nozzle expansion process, as well as going over a specific design example of actually starting with a few design parameters and designing our engine all the way to a final um, physical design of our rocket engine. And so if you haven't watched the first part, I definitely recommend watching that. That'll introduce a lot of these important concepts uh, that'll be crucial to understanding these next few parts as well as understanding um, what's going on behind the scenes when we actually do this design example. So again, watch part one. This is going to be part two of the series. Uh, there'll be a lot of information in this. And without further ado, let's start by talking about the nozzle expansion process. Okay, so now that we know the temperature of this combustion reaction and have a general sense for the energy released during that process, we can move forward with designing the optimal nozzle for converting that heat energy into useful kinetic energy to move our vehicle. So I've talked a lot about this conversion of heat energy into kinetic energy, but the question is, what does that actually look like in the math with the quantities that we have? And why is the temperature so important for this calculation and the overall design process? An important property that relates the enthalpy to the temperature is the specific heat at constant pressure. And so this is equal to the change in enthalpy over the change in temperature. So put into words, what this is describing is the change in heat energy or enthalpy per unit mass experienced by a substance for a given change in temperature. So in other words, it is the amount of energy required to raise one kilogram of a particular substance by a temperature of one degree. So substances that have low specific heats require a low amount of energy to raise their temperature, whereas substances with high specific heats require a large amount of energy to raise their temperature, an example being water. So looking back at our diagram, we're talking about the conversion of heat energy to kinetic energy. And so to conserve energy in this process, it means that any increase in the kinetic energy throughout the process must be equal to a decrease in heat energy or enthalpy. So if we write this out, we see that the change in enthalpy is equal to the change in kinetic energy uh, throughout this process. And by using our relation to temperature, we can express this change in kinetic energy uh, in relation to the change in temperature. So this is why the temperature of the combustion gases is very important for figuring out velocities along the nozzle. And so this equation will be used to derive a lot of the equations we'll be talking about. Um, these derivations I won't necessarily be walking through, but nevertheless, this is a very important equation that, describe, that relates to kinetic energy to the heat energy. In addition to the specific heat at constant pressure, another important thermodynamic property is the specific heat at constant volume. So this is describing a similar thing, but instead of describing the change in enthalpy over the change in temperature, it's the change in internal energy. And so this is neglecting that pressure times volume term uh, that's included in the enthalpy, but still very similar. And so the, the ratio between these two values is another important thermodynamic property called the specific heat ratio. So that is the CP over CV. And these values, again, are tabulated for different substances in these tables that look like this. So here you can see for many different substances, you can see the specific heats, uh, both types and the ratio between the two. And note that this is at standard condition of 25 degrees Celsius, but it's gonna vary uh, based on the temperature. Something that's important to note is that naturally, all of this heat energy will convert into kinetic energy, whether or not we have a chamber, right? Think about an explosion without a chamber. What you get is these high local areas of pressure and temperature at the source of the explosion. And so naturally, that needs to equalize with the pressure and temperature of the atmosphere, and you'll get kinetic energy going in every direction. And so this is useless for us though, because all these velocity vectors, if you don't have a controlled expansion of these gases, will just cancel out, right? All these vectors in opposite directions come out to a net movement of zero. And so what we're trying to do with our chamber is expand the gas ideally towards the bottom of the rocket so that the rocket moves in the opposite direction. And so a nozzle that is optimally designed such that all of the kinetic energy is directly straight from the bottom of the nozzle is called an optimal, optimally expanded nozzle. And so what, you, what you're trying to do here is get the pressure of the gas at the exit of the nozzle equal to the pressure of the atmosphere 
so that the vectors are straight moving towards the bottom. Uh, on the other hand, you have an underexpanded nozzle. And so this happens when the pressure at the exit, the pressure of the gases at the exit of the nozzle are greater than the pressure of the atmosphere. And so some of the gas will move, not directly straight, but in some direction um, slightly outwards, which is what these vectors represent. And the reason this is non-ideal is because you still have velocity components going straight towards the bottom, but these components that are going in opposite directions are just gonna cancel out. So you're wasting energy uh, that's not being used to move the rocket uh, upwards. Uh, the other type of unideal nozzle is an overexpanded nozzle. And so this is the opposite when the pressure of the gases at the exit is less than the pressure of the atmosphere. And what happens here is that because of this difference, the atmosphere atmospheric pressure kind of pushes in on these gases and decreases the area uh, at which um, the gas is exiting. And so again, the, you're losing efficiency here because uh, this velocity is not acting over the entirety of the uh, nozzle area. And you're also wasting mass because this the, the nozzle's too long, uh, the pressure is decreasing too much, and so you're, you're essentially wasting mass with this extra piece of nozzle that you don't need. And so back to our thrust equation, that extra term I mentioned briefly at the beginning is due to these differences in pressure. So P2 here is the pressure at the exit of the nozzle. P3 is the exit or the pressure uh, of the atmosphere, the ambient pressure. And so what we're trying to do is get P2 and P3 to be equal. Um, and if your nozzle is not ideally expanded, uh, this term will decrease the total thrust you're getting. So you might be wondering, what about the, the case of the underexpanded nozzle, right? When the pressure of the exit is greater than the atmosphere, won't that increase the thrust? Um, well, it looks like that, but not really, because if that's the case, then for the same mass flow rate, what you're getting is actually less velocity uh, moving towards the bottom of the nozzle. So this velocity this velocity term represents the, uh, the velocity that's parallel to the rocket and not these other uh, velocity vectors going up to the sides of the rocket. And so, yes, if you have higher pressure at the exit, this term will be some positive value. But uh, if you do the math for the rest of the expansion process, what that comes out to is a smaller velocity. And the velocity and mass flow rate term here is much more significant. And so that's why we're, what we're trying to do is get P2 and P3 to be equal so that we have an ideally expanded nozzle where all of the velocity is moving parallel to the rocket. Before we go into a lot of the equations we'll use to describe the nozzle expansion process, I want to talk a little bit about properties. So for any control volume, any defined volume of some substance or collection of substances, you have a series of properties associated with it. So here you have mass, you have the actual volume, the pressure, the temperature, and the density of this volume. And so what happens if you split the volume in half? What you'll see is that some of these properties also get cut in half, such as the mass. Uh, if you have a uniform density, the actual volume gets cut in half by cutting the volume in half. But some of these other properties remain the same. The pressure, temperature, and density are unaffected by cutting this volume in half. And so those properties that do change depending on the mass of um, that volume you're talking about are called the extensive properties. So again, these depend on the mass and vary with the mass of the volume. And the properties that don't change based off the total mass of the system you're talking about are called the intensive properties. So pressure, temperature, and density are the important ones we're gonna be talking mostly about for this particular uh, subject. And what's important to know is that if you know any two of these intensive properties, you can figure out the third. And so the equation that relates uh, the intensive properties is called the ideal gas law. And so the ideal gas law doesn't apply to all gases, but applies to the gases we're gonna be talking about. So those product gases from the combustion process uh, can ap or apply to the ideal gas law. And what you have is that the pressure times the specific volume, um, so specific volume being meters cubed over kilograms, so volume per unit mass, equal the gas constant times the temperature. And so this is a very important equation for relating the different properties in our nozzle. And so one more thing about this gas constant, the gas constant is specific to different substances and it's essentially composed of the ideal gas constant, which is just a universal constant uh, defined at the bottom here, divided by the molecular weight of the gas we're talking about. And so like those other properties, the gas constant is tabulated for different uh, substances, different gases. 
and unlike the specific heats, uh, the gas constant is constant across all temperature values. And so again, this ideal gas law is gonna be very important for solving um, these intensive properties when we know two of them and just developing a, a holistic understanding of what's happening in the nozzle. Also important to note is that the specific volume is just the reciprocal of density, right? Density is kilograms per meter cubed. Specific volume is meters cubed per kilogram. So oftentimes we'll use the specific volume in replacement of the density, but it's really the same thing. Okay, let's do a little example. So here it says to consider a rocket engine with two megapascals of chamber pressure, 2200 degree Kelvin combustion temperature, which you would figure out using a chemical solver or the process we described earlier, and R equals 345 joules per kilogram Kelvin uh, for the particular gas mixture in this chamber. And it's asking what is the density of the combustion gas mixture in the chamber? So what I have here is a diagram that we'll be using a lot that basically lists the properties that we're especially interested in at different points in the uh, chamber and nozzle. So here you have the beginning of the chamber, you have the inlet into the nozzle, uh, nozzle section being the part, this converging, diverging thing. Um, and then you have the throat, which is the minimum area, uh, and then finally the nozzle exit. So these are the four areas we're especially interested in. And so looking at our chamber, we have the temperature and pressure that are known values and like we said if you know two of these intensive properties then you can figure out the third and so what that means is that if you can cross off the top two values in any of these sections then you'll know the third um, and so here we know the temperature and the pressure we can find the density using that ideal gas law we just talked about and so that is simply you know solving for the specific volume a uh, specific volume is the reciprocal of density and we can just rearrange that ideal gas law equation, plug in these values which were given in the statement, and we get a density of 2.635 kilograms per meter cubed. Another very important concept here that comes from the conservation of mass principle is that the mass flow rate into the system is equal to the mass flow rate out of the system. In this case, the system being our engine. And so this also means that the mass flow rate is equal at any point within the system. And so what you get is that the mass flow rate into the chamber uh, in the form of propellant, liquid propellants, is equal to the mass flow rate of the exhaust gases out. And that's a very important relation for solving for the rest of this chamber. And what that also means is that the mass flow rate at the throat, uh, which is the thinnest part of the chamber, is equal to the mass flow rate out. And this will be very important in a bit. So related to the mass flow rate is the volumetric flow rate. So whereas the mass flow rate is in kilograms per second, the volumetric flow rate, uh, in this case Q, which is not to be mistaken for Q uh, in the context of heat transfer where we talked about earlier. Uh, so Q volumetric flow rate here is meters Q per second. And so volumetric flow rate is related to the velocity of the fluid flow and the cross-sectional area at w through which it's flowing. And you can see that with the units. So velocity in meters per second times the area through which it's flowing will give you that volumetric flow rate. And volumetric flow rate is also related to the mass flow rate in the same way that volume and mass are related with density, right? So volumetric flow rate is equal to the mass flow rate in kilograms per second divided by the density. And again, you can see with these units that this checks out. So building off the idea of the conservation of mass flow rate, uh, you can see that at any two points in our engine, the mass flow rates are equal and expanding this mass flow rate term based off um, the velocity area and density, you get that um, the area times velocity divided by the specific volume at point X is equal to the same. Uh, so the area, velocity and specific volume at point Y. And again, this relation, which relates any two points within the engine based off conservation of mass flow rate is going to be very useful for using one section of the engine to get information about another section, whether it's the chamber and the exit or the throat with the exit etc. You get the idea. And this is equation number seven on the equation sheet. So let's see an example. Again, so the question here says, consider a rocket engine with a total mass flow rate of 1.3 kilograms per second. And so this is the flow rate at any point in the engine, an exit area of 35 centimeters squared and an exit or an exhaust specific volume, um, which you can relate to density of 5.8 meters cubed per kilograms. What is the velocity of the exhaust gas and what is the thrust generated? So again, remember, we're very concerned with the velocity of our gases as they exit the nozzle. 
And what we have here, we know the mass flow rate. Uh, so this is mass flow rate at any point. We know the density at the exit because we have the specific volume and they're related via reciprocal. And we know the area at the exit. And so here you can see these terms we just talked about in the previous slide. And so the relation between them, we see that the velocity is equal to um, this term just from rearranging that equation on the previous slide. And we can plug in all these numbers that were given to get the exhaust velocity of 2150 meters per second. So it's very fast. And remember, this velocity is very important. The velocity is what's giving us that thrust upwards. So it makes sense that these exhaust gases are moving out of the nozzle at a very high speed. And so what is the thrust generated? Remember, go, going back to our thrust equation, we have that thrust in, in an ideally expanded nozzle is equal to the mass flow rate times the exhaust velocity. And here we'll assume that the nozzle is ideally expanded. Plug in the value for mass flow rate that we got in the statement with the velocity we just solved for. And we see that our thrust is 2,800 newtons. So this is a good example to see how knowing certain properties can tell you a lot about other properties just through these relations. So we, here we figured out the thrust based off things that are seemingly, you know, not that related, like the density of our gas and the area. But as we build up these equations, you'll see that everything's connected and that just starting off a few properties, you can build up a better full understanding of what's going on all the way down to figuring out the thrust that it's generating. Something I've said a lot up to this point is that we're converting all of our heat energy from the combustion reaction into kinetic energy for moving the rocket forward. And so in reality, when we look at a real nozzle, we're actually losing a bit of energy along the way. And so the first way we lose energy is via heat transfer out of the system, right? Out of the nozzle, through the walls of the chamber and nozzle. And that's what you see here with this Q out. There's heat leaving the system by conducting through this wall, which is represented with this temperature or color gradient that I've depicted here. So the second way we're losing useful energy is through friction, right? As the gases move out of the chamber, there's a little bit of friction at the boundary between the gas and the wall of the nozzle that causes a loss of useful energy. And so energy loss to friction is called irreversible energy because like you can't really do anything with the energy that's lost to friction. You can't really reverse the process and get energy out of that. And so what that corresponds to is an increase in what's called entropy. So entropy here is represented with the letter S and the process of losing energy in an irreversible process uh, along the nozzle uh, can be correlated to an increase in entropy. So you start with a certain amount of entropy at the beginning and by the end you've lost energy to friction, which means your entropy is higher. Right? Like the chaos can be thought of as chaos, the chaos of the system is higher. And so to simplify our calculations, we're gonna assume that one, there is no heat transfer out of the system. And so for that reason, we call it an adiabatic process, no heat transfer. And two, that the entropy remains constant. So we're not actually losing any energy to friction and that along the way, our entropy remains the same. So in reality, I mean, there's a considerable amount of energy lost to these two processes, but when talking about the conversion of energy from one point to another, we can kind of ignore that to simplify our calculations and then do some small corrections later to account for it anyway. So what you get out of that is what's called the isentropic relations. And when we consider that no energy is lost to heat transfer or friction, it really simplifies things and we can assume that the total amount of energy remains constant and perform a lot of different or relations um, on these different properties. And so this would be much more complicated if, if we had to consider um, losses of energy along the way, which can depend on a lot of different variables. And so what you get out of this, I won't derive this, but you can look on your own how the isentropic relations are derived. It's pretty interesting. But what's the, so the important thing that comes out of this is that the temperature, pressure, and specific volumes are all related at different points um, with the specific heat ratio. So you can see here at point X, and why between any two points in this process, you can relate the temperature uh, and pressure. So if you have the temperature at those two points and the pressure at one of those points, you can find the pressure at that other point. And so same thing with the specific volume. And with these three equations, you can form a lot of different uh, relations between these, these um, properties. So this is equation 11 on the sheet. 
And we'll see an example of how you can use this to determine certain properties of the chamber. So for a rocket engine with 2.4 megapascals chamber pressure and 2800 Kelvin combustion temperature, it's asking determine the temperature of the gas at the nozzle exit and assume the nozzle is ideally expanded at sea level and that K equals 1.3 for the gas mixture. So here you see we start off knowing the temperature and pressure at the chamber and we're being asked to determine the temperature at the exit. Um, and so first thing we'll note is that for an ideally expanded nozzle, remember we talked about the pressure at the exit is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. So at sea level, the atmosphere is 14.7 PSI, which means that for an ideally expanded nozzle, our exit pressure will also equal this. So we do in fact know the pressure at the exit. So now that we have a pressure or pressures at two different points at the chamber and the nozzle exit and a temperature at one of those points, we can use our isentropic relations to find the temperature at that second point, right? So if we write out the uh, isentropic relation between temperature and pressure, this is what we get. Rearranging, we can find that the temperature at the exit is 1340 Kelvin. Um, and so you can see that it goes through a huge decrease in temperature along the way. And so here you can really see how the isentropic relations are powerful, right? Like we know something just based off the information at one point and limited information at the other point, we can f determine a lot about that second point, uh, the, here being the nozzle exit. And so this also could have applied at the throat if we knew the pressure at the throat or the temperature of the throat or the density at the throat. Uh, these isentropic relations really allow us to determine a lot about different points in the nozzle uh, just by relating what properties we do know across those different points. Another important equation is the local speed of sound in meters per second. And so that you can see is a function of the specific heat ratio of the medium. Um, so that's our gases or combustion gases in this case, the gas constant for that medium and the temperature of the medium. And so the speed of sound will vary depending on these three things. And so an important number that we're concerned with, concerned with is the Mach number. And the Mach number is the ratio of our velocity, the velocity of the flow or of the fluid, in this case our combustion gases in the nozzle, to the local speed of sound. And so anytime we talk about speed in a combustion chamber or in a nozzle, we're usually going to hear it in the context of this Mach number as opposed to like some raw um, velocity value. And that's just because it wraps in a lot of these thermodynamic properties that we're concerned with. So again, Mach number, when you see that, think speed. And the Mach number is, again, the ratio of that flow velocity to the local speed of sound. So if you see a Mach number and you know these thermodynamic properties at that particular point, you can back out the uh, velocity. And these are equations 12 and 13 on that sheet. So here we have a very important result that describes how the area changes with the velocity or how the velocity changes with the area as a function of the Mach number at the particular point we're talking about. And so this equation comes from combining the energy conservation requirement, the conservation of mass, um, the thermodynamic relations we talked about earlier, and a clever substitution of the speed of sound. And so again, what you get here is an equation that explains how area changes with velocity as a function of our Mach number at that particular point. And so let's see exactly what that means. So the first case we have is that our Mach number is less than one, right? Our local fluid velocity is less than the local speed of sound. And this is called the subsonic regime where Mach is less than one. And so if you plug in a Mach number less than one into this equation, you'll see that dADV is less than zero. And so what this means is that the slope of area to, or the, the slope of air, the area velocity relation is negative. And so in words, what that means is that the velocity decreases with an increase in area. So another way to look at this is that the velocity increases with a decrease in area. And so represented visually down here, you can see in a variable area duct like this, where the area, the cross-sectional area is increasing along the x-axis. Alongside that increase is a decrease in the velocity. So again, the area gets bigger, our velocity is decreasing. Another way to look at it is if the fluid was flowing in the opposite direction towards the left side of my screen, it would increase in speed, right? So the decrease, the area would be decreasing and alongside that, it means that the velocity would have to increase, right? We have this negative uh, relation um, between the area and the velocity. And this happens at subsonic speeds. So the other case we have is that M is greater than one. This means that our local fluid velocity is higher than the local speed of sound. 
and this is called the supersonic regime, right? If you think about like fighter jets going at Mach greater than one, this is because they're moving faster than the speed of sound in the, the medium in which they're in, which is air. So again, Mach number is greater than one, it's supersonic, and if you plug that into the equation, you'll see that you get the opposite as our previous case, where dA dV is greater than zero. So you have a positive correlation between the increase in area and the increase in velocity. And so put into words, what that means is the velocity increases with an increase in area. So this is the opposite of what happens at subsonic regimes. You can see that with this diagram here. Uh, we have the same variable area duct. The area is increasing along the x-axis. And alongside that, we have an increase in velocity. So this only makes sense. This only works at supersonic speeds when we're going faster than the speed of sound. That's the only way we can really increase our velocity um, as the area increases. Right? If we're at subsonic speeds, then along this variable area duct, the velocity would decrease. The last case is when m equals 1. So m, this, the local fluid speed is exactly equal to the speed of sound. And that is called sonic speed, exactly to the speed of sound. And if you plug m equals 1 into this equation, you'll get that dA dV equals 0. So what does this actually mean? So this means that this sonic speeds can only occur at a local area minimum, right? When the change in area, or the, 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 yeah, the change in area at this local point is zero. And so if you look at this variable area duct that starts off with a negative change in area, right? A decreasing area, and then becomes an increasing in area along the X axis, there's a point at which the change in area, the local change in area is zero. And so this is the only point at which we can actually get Mach equals one. And so you can see how these different regimes kind of influence the design of our uh, rocket engine nozzle, right? Again, what we're trying to do is speed up our gas, the speeds of our exhaust gas to the highest speed possible by the time it reaches the nozzle exit. So it should constantly be speeding up along this process. And so, at the beginning in the chamber and at the beginning of the nozzle, we are at subsonic speeds, right? If our, the moment it enters the chamber, the velocity is zero. And the whole time what we're trying to do here is speed it up to the greatest speed possible. So for this first portion, we are again at subsonic speeds. The Mach number is less than one. And what we're trying to do is speed it up. So that's why um, in our nozzle, the first thing that happens is that the area starts to decrease because we're trying to speed it up. So we're at subsonic speeds which means an area or an area decrease correlates with a velocity increase, right? And that's going back to this subsonic regime. So up until the throat, we're speeding up with a decrease in area. And then remember what happens at the throat is, again, this is depending on the pressure in the combustion chamber. The pressure in the chamber is gonna drive this uh, increase in speed. But what happens at the throat if we design it properly is that we reach Mach one at this particular point. So we're speeding up, we're speeding up, we're speeding up. Once we hit the throat, we reach that local speed of sound. And what that means is that afterwards, um, the, the gas is gonna continue to speed up, assuming our pressure is high enough in the chamber. And so again, we're trying to speed up the, the gases to the high speed possible up until this point. To do that, we have to decrease the area, but after the throat, we're at Mach one. And so we're trying to speed it up. Mach number is greater than one and we can continue to speed it up at this point in this regime by actually increasing the area. And so that's why after the throat, we have a diverging section where the area is increasing and alongside that, our velocity is also increasing. So again, what you could, what could happen is if the pressure is not high enough in the combustion chamber, we can speed it up to Mach 1 at the throat, but then it'll actually continue to slow down, right? If we don't reach Mach numbers greater than one past the throat and we're still in the subsonic regime, then this increase in area is gonna to correspond to a decrease in velocity based off this subsonic regime equation. And so what we're trying to do is reach high enough pressures in the combustion chamber um, to drive this increase in velocity past the throat uh, in the, the supersonic regime. So I won't derive this equation, but again, this is a pretty important equation that um, comes from you know similar, from the conservation of mass and uh, performing similar manipulations, uh, but this is going to relate the area ratio uh, to the Mach number ratio um, in a nozzle. 
and so we can you can see how the areas at two different points are going to correspond to a ratio of Mach numbers and in this equation is the specific heat ratio and so this is equation number 14 I definitely recommend like messing around with this equation to see like for different um, points in the nozzle what's going to happen to the Mach number so to introduce the next set of equations I'd like you to consider our rocket engine nozzle and a block of exhaust gas that is moving in the uh, diverging section of the nozzle so this block of gas is moving at some speed greater than zero and then has all these properties so this block of gas if you think about the total energy of this particular block of gas you can see that it's a combination of the kinetic energy from the speed at which it's moving and the heat energy right that heat energy we talked about like the internal energy plus the pressure times volume of that piece of gas and so a question we can ask ourselves is that if we brought that piece of gas to rest and removed all the kinetic energy from it, but maintained the same total energy, what would be the total heat energy? And so expanding on that, what would be the pressure and temperature and specific volume of that moving piece of gas if it were brought to rest and all of that kinetic energy was instead put into the heat energy of that piece of gas. So you can see in the context of our nozzle, that would be asking what is this, what are the properties of this block of gas when it was at the chamber, when the heat energy was formed the total energy of that block before it started gaining kinetic energy. And so you can see at this point in the chamber, the properties of the gas, the pressure, temperature, and volume, um, when it's not moving, when all the energy is in the heat energy, uh, these are called the stagnation properties of that uh, fluid. And so asking that question and then using the uh, enthalpy, conservation of enthalpy uh, with the thermodynamic relations, you can form these equations that relate the temperatures in the stagnant condition to the temperature as a function of the speed at which it's moving. So in this case, we use the Mach number. Remember I said that when we talk about velocity, a lot of times we use the Mach number uh, in replacement. So these equations are describing the stagnation properties of the fluid as a function of the temperature, pressure, and density at some other point when it's moving at some speed greater than one. So as a function of this Mach number. And so these are very important equations for describing what the properties in the chamber are uh, in relation to what they're going to be further downstream in our engine when they're moving at some speed greater than one. And so this equation in particular, the stagnation pressure, is what determines what speed it's going to be able to move at uh, further downstream than nozzle. Remember I said like the pressure in the chamber is a very important factor for determining whether our nozzle is going to be able to reach these supersonic speeds downstream of the nozzle. And so if you think about the inputs into that relation, we have the Mach number, pressure in the chamber, and the pressure at the exit, right? So that pressure differential. And so this stagnation pressure equation is very important for determining if our pressure in the chamber is high enough to reach Mach numbers greater than one uh, further downstream in the nozzle. And so this uh, relation between the stagnation pressure or the chamber pressure and pressure further downstream is gonna determine you know, what speed it's actually able to move at. And so this goes both ways. We can also use the speed if we know the speed to figure out what uh, conditions are required in the chamber. So what we can do is use these stagnation condition equations to develop equations for the throat specifically, right? We know the throat is gonna have a Mach number of one. So if we plug in one into these equations, we can simplify them for specifically the throat or the critical conditions. And so here you have the conditions at the throat, the temperature, pressure, and specific volumes at the throat as a function of the stagnation condition. So these ones represent the inlet into, or the conditions at the nozzle inlet. Um, so that's this portion right here, uh, right when the converging section starts. And those can be approximated by those stagnation conditions or the chamber conditions. And so here again, we have the conditions at the throat as a function of the conditions in a chamber 
right? So this is relating the chamber conditions to the throat conditions by plugging in a Mach number of one in these stagnation condition equations where it's a more general uh, temperature, pressure, and density at any point uh, for a given Mach number. So again, we plug in one for the throat and then these properties become the throat conditions because that's where Mach, Mach is equal to one and we get these equations for the throat. And these are also on the equation sheet. So let's see an example of using uh, the various equations we just talked about to you know, develop more of this understanding of what's going on at various points in the chamber and the nozzle. So here the exa example says, for a rocket engine with 400 PSI of chamber pressure and a gas mixture um, where K, the specific heat ratio is 1.2, and in, so it's ideally expanded at sea level, determine the throat pressure and the exit Mach number. So what do we know here? We know the chamber pressure, we know that K equals 1.2, and again, because it's ideally expanded at sea level, we know what the exit pressure should be, right? It should be that atmospheric pressure. And so some other, uh, one more thing we do know is that the Mach number M at the throat is equal to one, and that's just always gonna be the case. Um, and so one more thing we do know is at the nozzle inlet, we can usually approximate the nozzle inlet conditions for temperature, pressure, and density to be equal to the chamber conditions. So we, we say that not much is changing between the beginning of the chamber and the end of the chamber when the nozzle starts. And so here's everything that we know. And we're trying to understand, trying to learn the throat pressure and the exit Mach number. So again, we, we can use that critical condition equation for pressure. Um, so Mach equals one in the stagnation equation. And here we know P1, uh, which we can approximate as the pressure in the chamber, we know K. And so with that, we can pretty easily figure out our throat pressure. So this is a nice equation because it's really just dependent on that chamber pressure and it can tell us what our throat pressure is. So plugging numbers in, we see that the throat pressure is 226 PSI. So notice that the pressure is constantly decreasing as the velocity increases. So along this whole um, nozzle and chamber, our velocity is increasing. And so our, thro our pressure is decreasing all the way to that atmospheric value. So it's decreasing from 400 to the atmospheric value of 14.7 PSI. And so naturally along that path at the throat, um, it's around half the pressure. And we get that with this equation. So for the exit Mach number, what we can do is use the more general stagnation condition equation for pressure. Um, so this time we don't know what the Mach number is yet. And we're trying to figure that out based on the ratio of the pressure between uh, the chamber and the exit. So here for P naught, we have our chamber pressure, right? When everything's not moving, velocity equals zero. And for our P downstream, pressure downstream, we're going all the way to the end uh, at the exit when the pressure at the exit is equal to the atmosphere. And then we can solve for that Mach number. And we see that at the exit, Mach number is 2.7. So you can clearly see here, based off this difference in pressure in the chamber and at the exit, we get, we were able to achieve these supersonic speeds of uh, over Mach 1, 2.7. And so, I mean, mess around with this equation for sure and see how this pressure ratio between the exit, which is usually fixed at atmospheric pressure, and your chamber pressure affect what Mach number you're able to achieve. And so this is what I mean by like, if the chamber pressure is too low, you won't be able to achieve these supersonic speeds. And you can use this equation to figure that out. So here we see 2.7 of the exit. Again, we're moving very fast. Like the gases are going extremely fast out of the nozzle. And that's what's giving us thrust. One more important equation is the nozzle exit velocity. That's what we were just talking about. So this is derived from just manipulating the, a lot of the equations we've already talked about, um, like the conservation of mass, um, the Mach equation, and then just backing out that velocity uh, from those equations, you can see that the velocity is a function of like the chamber temperature uh, and then that pressure ratio. So you can, this is that same pressure ratio between that we just mentioned between the chamber and the exit. Um, so our exit velocity is gonna be a function of chamber temperature and the ratio between the pressure of the atmosphere or our exit pressure and our chamber pressure. So with this equation, we can quickly calculate uh, what our exit velocity is going to be. And remember, the velocity is an important input into that thrust, uh, the thrust equation. So you can see how this becomes important, and that's equation nine on the sheet. So with all these different equations and all these different properties at different points in the nozzle, it can get pretty confusing to get a 
holistic idea of what's going on at these different points in the nozzle expansion process and what are the different properties, how are they relating over the course of this expansion. So what I've done here is come up with a specific example with some particular numbers and plotted exactly what is happening uh, with these different properties as they expand in the nozzle. So on the x-axis here we have the pressure, right? The pressure starts at some high value in the chamber and then it's going to decrease along the nozzle and chamber until we reach that exit pressure, which for an ideally expanded nozzle is going to be exactly equal to our ambient uh, atmospheric pressure. And so along this, we see a few things. First, our temperature is decreasing from some very high value, and that's that combustion, adiabatic flame temperature of the combustion, to a much lower value. And that's symbolic of the decrease in heat energy that correlates with that increase in kinetic energy. So increase in kinetic energy, we can see that at the beginning in the chamber, our velocity is zero and our Mach number is zero. But through this expansion process, as we gain kinetic energy, the velocity is gonna to increase to some very high value around 1800 meters per second. And alongside that, following a similar curve is the Mach number. Mach number is gonna start at zero. And remember we get Mach equals one at the throat. And then as it continues to expand, in the, di in the diverging section, we get a further increase in Mach number up to a maximum value of 2.6 at the exit for an ideally expanded nozzle. And so the reason these curves are similar but not exact is because again, the Mach number is a function of temperature. So temperature has some input into this Mach number, uh, whereas the velocity is just an independent uh, velocity number. So the area, remember, at first our area is going to decrease while we're in the subsonic regime to speed up the gas. And then once we reach the throat, we get that local area minimum we talked about, and then it's gonna increase after the throat once we reach that supersonic regime to continue to increase our uh, exhaust gas up to these greater speeds. So the last thing here is the specific volume or the density of our gas. You can see that the specific volume is gonna increase. So this corresponds to a decrease in density as the gas expands out of the nozzle. So this is a very useful plot to look at to get an idea, uh, you know, to zoom out and get an idea of how different things are changing over the course of the expansion process. And definitely, I mean, these can all like these curves can be determined with all the equations we've developed. So def it's definitely worth looking at the equations, plugging in some numbers and see how certain properties affect others throughout the course of this uh, process of expansion. So at this point, we have a lot of these equations that describe what's actually going on inside of our rocket engine, in our nozzle, in the chamber. But it can be a bit overwhelming to start to think about how you use these equations to actually design the engine and size the nozzle. And so what we'll do next is actually walk through a specific example of setting a few parameters at the beginning or design requirements for our engine and using the equations to develop a full picture of what it should look like in terms of the shape and size. And so with this, it should really become clear how how to use these different equations, um, approaching them from different angles to really develop a full picture and eventually get uh, a full nozzle design in terms of the size and shape. The first step of the design process is to choose our particular propellant combination. So the reason we do this first is because we need to know the temperature of the combustion as well as the specific properties of our exhaust gas. Uh, these are important inputs for the rest of the design process. And so the main considerations you want to be thinking about when choosing propellants are kind of its temperature. Um, there's a wide range of you know, te operating temperatures for these propellants. Some of them are extremely cold called cryogen cryogens or cryogenic fluids, uh, whereas others are liquids at room temperature, which make them much easier to handle. You also want to consider the theoretical performance of these propellants. Different combinations have different maximum theoretical performances, and the performance is inversely related to the molecular weight of your propellant. So usually the lighter the molecule is, the higher the performance will be. Other things you want to consider are just generally general handling, general handling. How safe is it to handle? How difficult is it? What does it need particular conditions to be stored? Um, how dangerous is it? if you are exposed to it, if you touch it, uh, things like that. And so the final consideration, of course, you need to think about the cost. So there's a wide range of costs for these different propellants. Uh, some of them are extremely hard to acquire and expensive to get, uh, whereas others are relatively easy and can be ordered for cheap or just even like gotten at a gas station, for example. So in an attempt to encapsulate the differences between these different propellants in some sort of standardized way, what I've done here is created a visual point system 
to kind of rank these different propellants based on the considerations we just talked about. And so generally speaking, what you'll see here is that the more points you have uh, corresponds to more desirable traits for that particular um, parameter. So for temperature, the higher, the more boxes it has, the closer or the warmer the operating temperature will be. Um, for performance, more boxes means higher potential performance. Uh, for safety, the safer it is, the more boxes it'll have. And for cost, the cheaper it is, the more boxes it'll have. So not great, but um, I think it's a good way to you know encapsulate these differences. And so definitely take this with a grain of salt. Um, there's obviously a lot of nuances that aren't really captured in this simple analysis of propellants. Um, there's entire books written on different propellants. People have been researching this stuff for years. Um, and you know these different parameters kind of will depend on where you are, what your local resources are and things like that. So definitely, you definitely wanna do your own research before choosing your propellants, but this is a generally uh, high level overview of the differences between these. And so for oxidizers, uh, there are several options, but the main one used in industry and the one we use at SEB is liquid oxygen. So liquid oxygen generally has pretty good, I mean, yeah, great performance uh, with different fuels. Um, it's relatively cheap and easy to get. Um, and so the downsides of liquid oxygen though is that it's cryogenic, so it's very cold um, at, an, at an operating temperature uh, at a liquid. And it's gonna be a bit corrosive, I mean, very corrosive and very reactive. So you have to be careful with the way you're handling it. Um, so to avoid some of these things, people use nitric acid. Nitric acid is pretty commonly used. Um, I've definitely seen several rockets use nitric acid as opposed to LOX. And the main reason people do this is to avoid dealing with the cryogenic aspect of LOX. And so performance is pretty similar, um, still not impossible to um, obtain, not too expensive, but nitric acid is also very, very corrosive and reactive. And so, I mean, none of these oxidizers are quote unquote safe to use. You definitely have to be careful, but uh, some are just slightly less dangerous than others. And so liquid fluorine, is completely impractical. You're never gonna use this, but I've just included it to point out that the theoretical performance of fluorine is much higher than uh, any other oxidizer. So great potential performance, but completely impractical. Nobody has built a rocket with this uh, just because it's extremely reactive and will essentially deteriorate anything you try to contain it with. So for our cases, again, we'll use LOX uh, in our example, and LOX is what we use at SEB and what a lot of rocket teams and rocket companies uh, generally use. So onto the fuels. Easily the best fuel for performance is liquid hydrogen. And this is because hydrogen is the lightest molecule, right? It's just H2, very small molecule. You're not carrying around those extra heavy carbons. And for that reason, you get the highest theoretical perf performance. The downside of it though, is that it's the coldest fuel known. It's almost absolute zero at in the liquid state. And so you need to do a lot of work to keep it at those low temperatures to insulate your tanks and make sure it doesn't boil off at a fast rate. Hydrogen is also very reactive and very explosive. And so generally speaking, handling is um, something you really have to consider and be careful with. So liquid hydrogen is not very practical at the amateur level. Um, it's used in industry, the space shuttle use hydrogen, um, but you're pro most likely not gonna use that um, if you're just starting out and building smaller scale rockets. Generally speaking though, a lot of these other hydrocarbons are pretty reasonable options and at a high level don't vary too much in terms of their performance and general handling safety. Methane has one of the higher performances of these other hydrocarbons um, because it is a lighter molecule, only has one carbon attached to it. But the downside is that methane is a cryogenic liquid. So again, you have to insulate your tanks and be wary about um, making sure not too much heat escapes from your, your methane tanks. Um, so another thing to note about ethanol and kerosene is that these are liquids at room temperature, which makes them pretty desirable for the amateur level. Um, you don't have to worry about, you know, cryo cryogenic considerations. Um, you don't have to worry about insulating your tanks as much and you can just have them be a liquid. You're not losing as much um, propellant to boil off, which is what happens with these cryogenic um, the cryogenic propellants. Um, so propane is all around a pretty good option. It's not cryogenic, but it's not a liquid at room temperature either. It's a gas at room temperature. temperature. So I think at atmospheric pressure, it's a liquid at around negative 40 degrees. Um, so not a cryogenic, but you still are, have to insulate your tanks. Think about boil off. Um, and so at SEB, we use propane just because, 
one of the main reasons is ease of access. We tried methane once, um, but it was kind of a, a big ordeal to uh, obtain it from a very particular source, whereas propane is very easy to get delivered to you from different gas providers, um, like air gas or prax air. These, they will deliver them for relatively cheap too. So again, ethanol and kerosene are very good options as well. Uh, I've seen them used in some amateur rockets, um, but any of these hydrocarbons are reasonable options. Again, pending your own research, look into what's available to you, um, and that, that should inform your decision. The next step once we've chosen our propellants is to actually constrain the thrust and the chamber pressure of our engine. Right, so these are the parameters that we're going to be designing around. These are the design parameters that determine what design we come up with. Uh, we got to start somewhere. And so we start by constraining the thrust, what thrust we want our engine to produce, and the chamber pressure, what pressure do we want in our combustion chamber. So for our cases, we'll be targeting a thrust of 15 kilonewtons and targeting a chamber pressure of 400 PSI. And so chamber pressure, chamber pressure is the main determining factor for thrust. The higher chamber pressure is for the same engine design, the higher the thrust will be. And so if we constrain the thrust of 15 kilonewtons and instead use a higher chamber pressure, what that means is that we'll more efficiently be able to reach this target thrust. So we'll have an uh, overall smaller engine that has less mass and less total mass flow rate moving through it to achieve the same target thrust. That's with a higher chamber pressure. And so the chamber pressure you select will ultimately come down to the feed system that you're using for your rocket. Uh, that's the main factor that will determine this. And so we'll talk about feed systems a bit more in a bit, but at a high level, if you're using a pressure fed system, so if a pressure and gas is feeding your propellants into the chamber, you'll probably need to target a chamber pressure between 100 and 500 past 500 PSI. Past that point, it's a bit difficult to actually get high enough pressures at your injector to achieve this chamber pressure. The other type of feed system that's a bit more complex and that's more often used in industry is a pump fed system. So there's many different specific types of engine cycles with pumps, but overall pumps will allow you to reach a much higher pressure uh, at the combustion chamber. So around a thousand PSI, some go much higher, some a bit lower, but overall you'll be able to achieve higher chamber pressures. And so to re reiterate the point, we want to constrain our thrust and chamber pressure and the higher chamber pressure we're able to achieve, the more efficiently we'll be able to produce the same amount of thrust. And so you really want to bring up the chamber pressure to as high as you're really capable of doing with whatever your feed system is. And also considering the ability of your combustion chamber to actually hold that pressure without destroying itself essentially. And so for our case, we'll use a 15, we're, we're, tar we're targeting 15 kilonewtons of thrust with a chamber pressure of 400 PSI. And we'll see how we can design the engine around these parameters. Okay, so step three is to choose our desired exit pressure. Remember for an optimally expanded nozzle, the exit pressure equals the atmospheric pressure so that our, all of our kinetic energy is directed towards the bottom of the rocket. And we're using all our velocity to move upwards. So this is very simple. If your engine is not designed to be flying at any point, you can just take the atmospheric pressure at sea level and set that to your exit pressure. It becomes a bit more complicated when you're flying upwards through an atmosphere that is changing in pressure, right? You can see with a plot here that the atmospheric pressure decreases pretty significantly with elevation. So pretty rapidly, uh, let's take a point here, 4,000 meters above sea level you can see that the atmospheric pressure has already decreased by a factor of two. And so the question is what pressure, what atmospheric pressure do we use as reference for our exit pressure, right? Because in theory, as you're flying through the air, there will only be one point at which your nozzle is ideally expanded. So what exit pressure do we use? So what you could do is do a complex study of efficiency uh, of your impulse and try to, you know, do some kind of optimization uh, over the course of your flight path. Um, but this can get quite convoluted and really only contribute in a small way to uh, the total performance of your rocket. So at the amateur level, which is what we're really focusing on here, you can just take this rule of thumb here, which is that the pressure 
at the exit of your nozzle should be roughly two thirds of the difference between the highest pressure you'll experience, so the lowest point, and the, and the lowest atmospheric pressure that your engine will experience. And so that'll be at the highest point of your rocket. Uh, so not the highest point of the actual flight path, but the highest point of your engine firing. So again, you can just take two thirds of the difference between essentially your sea level pressure and the, the atmosphere pressure at the highest altitude that you'll be flying. So for our case, we'll be targeting an exit pressure of around 10 PSI. And so this comes out to an altitude of 3000 meters, right? The atmospheric pressure decreases by around four PSI between zero meters and 3000 meters. And so we can say that the optimization or the altitude that our engine is optimized for is 3000 meters at which point it'll be ideally expanded. So the next step is to actually choose our OF ratio, our oxidizer to fuel ratio for a combustion reaction. And the reason this is important is because the OF ratio will determine our chamber temperature. And remember the chamber temperature is very important for determining that conversion of energy into kinetic energy. So the chamber temperature paired with our chamber pressure, which we have constrained at this point, are gonna be very useful starting points for determining the properties in the rest of the chamber, uh, which will then determine the actual areas of the various points. And we'll see what that looks like. But the main thing we're considering here in our selection of OF ratio is our actual efficiency. So different OF ratios will yield different efficiencies, uh, combustion efficiencies. And remember, our measure of efficiency is what's called the specific impulse, and it is directly um, determined by the velocity of our exhaust gas. So this velocity keeps coming up and it's coming up again here. Uh, we're trying to see, we're trying to get the highest exhaust gas velocity and um, the different OF ratios will contribute to various different um, velocities. And so remember our equation for the exhaust velocity is right here. And you can see we already have some of these inputs. Uh, P2 here is the exit pressure, which we have constrained in a previous step. Uh, and then the chamber pressure is P0. So we know these two things at this point and the rest of the inputs are related to our, um, to our OF ratio. So this is the specific heat ratio of our product gases, which will vary depending on how much oxidizer and fuel you have. Uh, the actual gas constant for our mixture of product gases, again, depends, or this will vary depending on our mixture of oxidizer to, oxidizer to fuel. And of course, our chamber temperature and this is uh, like the other properties here determined by what ratio we're using. And you can, if you think back to when we did that example of the adiabatic flame temperature, uh, this is what we were trying to figure out. And it had a lot to do with the ratio we were using. And so the way we can iterate over different OF ratios and see the different velocities that we get is using a chemical equilibrium solver. So RPA is one of them. That's the one we'll be using. Uh, and we'll go over RPA in a, in a second briefly. Uh, but there's other ones out there like NASA CEA. I, uh, I know there's various others. If you just look up chemical equilibrium solver, these are things that kind of just take in um, your different chemicals and then tell you a lot about the reaction that's occurring, like the energy released and then all these other properties. So what you'll do is you'll pass in the propellants, which in our case, we're using liquid oxygen and propane uh, and the actual mixture ratio, the OF ratio. And what that'll tell you is everything about that particular reaction. And so it'll tell you the um, specific heat ratio, the gas constant, and the adiabatic flame temperature for that particular reaction. So what you'll do to find your OF ratio is iterate over different OF ratios, plot the velocity, um, the exhaust gas velocity that you get. And we're just trying to find the sweet spot for the optimal efficiency or optimal exhaust gas velocity. And so you can see here, um, this is a plot that comes out of a book called Rocket Propulsion Elements by George Sutton. This is a really good book, definitely recommend it. Lots of nice plots like this. Uh, and here you can see what they've done is plotted for different mixture ratios, OF ratios, various different things, including the chamber temperature on this curve right here and the specific impulse or the efficiency uh, right under here. And so what's important to note here is that the chamber, the temperature continues to increase with the mixture ratio. So the more oxidizer you have, the hotter the reaction will be. And up to a certain point, a hotter reaction directly correlates to higher efficiency, uh, right? More heat energy, more kinetic energy. And so up to a certain point, that's the case. 
but you can see that the maximum specific impulse actually occurs before the maximum chamber temperature. And so this is related to the molecular weight of our product gases. Uh, and so the oxidizer in general is much heavier than the fuel. And so up to, at a certain point, more adding more oxidizer per unit fuel is just making everything heavier. And that actually uh, ends up slowing down the exhaust gas. So up to a certain point, you want a hotter chamber temperature, but there is this point right here, this maximum specific impulse at which heating it up more actually by adding more oxidizer um, doesn't contribute to higher efficiency. And so for this, I think in this example, they're using RP1. Um, so this is like refined kerosene. And so you can see the optimal OF ratio is around 2.3 for this. So here at SEB, we're very familiar with Lux Propane, and we kind of went through this process when we first started designing uh, our liquid rocket. And so what we found was that for Lux Propane, the optimal OF ratio is around 2.7, uh, and so the resulting combustion temperature is around 3,400 Kelvin. So this is a very hot reaction. And so the exhaust gas constant and specific heat ratios are as follows. And we'll see how we can use these numbers um, in the rest of our equations to actually design our engine. Okay, great, now to the fun part. So the next step now is to actually size our nozzle and our chamber. And so what does it mean to actually size the nozzle? What it really boils down to is essentially figuring out the cross-sectional areas of these different sections, right? Look at this simplified diagram. There's different, you can break it up by blocks based off their cross-sectional area. And so if we figure out the cross-sectional areas of the chamber, the throat, and the exit, then our job is made much easier, right? We can, we have these cross-sectional areas and we can essentially just connect the dots between these areas and get our nozzle profile. So the way you actually connect the dots is obviously much more nuanced than just randomly doing it. But if we know these cross-sectional areas, then we can move forward with actually connecting those areas in the most efficient way uh, to finalize the contour of our nozzle. And so the main equation we'll use to find these different areas is the mass flirt equation, right? Mass flirt equals density times area times velocity. And so we'll figure out the mass flow rate. Uh, the mass flow rate is constant throughout the engine. And we can figure out at different points what the density of our exhaust gas is, right? We have plenty of equations we've talked about for relating the different intensive properties. So with the ideal gas law, with our isentropic relations, we can relate different properties at different points. And that's essentially how we'll find these different densities. And then velocity is related to Mach number. You've seen that number in the, in the um, stagnation condition equations. And we know that Mach number is one at the throat. Um, and so that, that, that should give you a high level idea of how we're gonna approach this problem, right? We wanna find areas at different points. We can do that by finding densities at different points, the mass flow rate and velocity at different points. And we'll see exactly how we do that with the information that we're starting with, right? The parameters that we've decided up to this point. Okay, so to find our areas, what I've done here is written a lot of the equations that we'll be using in Python, uh, in this Python file right here, just so that we don't have to do the math by hand. But, um, so I'll go through these equations and I've actually attached pictures of them here so you know which equations we're referencing. But uh, these functions will help us just get through this a little bit quicker. And so at the top of this notebook here, what I have is all the parameters we've talked about so far, right? We have our desired thrust, 15 kilonewtons, our chamber pressure in Pascals, since we'll be standardizing our units to SI units. Uh, so this is 400 PSI in Pascals. We have our exit pressure, which is 10 PSI in Pascals, our OF ratio 2.7, our chamber temperature from uh, our calculations earlier, which is 3400 Kelvin, and the properties of our exhaust gas. And so looking at our diagram here, remember what we're trying to do is find all of our areas. And to find our areas, we're gonna use that mass flow rate equation, which means we need to know our mass flow rate and we need to know our densities at the different points, uh, as well as the velocity of the gases at the different points. And so those things paired together, uh, we can find our area. Uh, so area would be that missing unknown in the mass flow rate equation. So first let's start with the throat. Um, we have an equation that outputs the throat temperature as a function of the temperature at the nozzle inlet. 
And so to simplify things, we can assume that all the nozzle inlet conditions are the same as the chamber conditions. Um, and so this is not always the case, but it usually is the case for most rocket engines. So anytime you see a one, you can interchange it with the corresponding zero. Um, so taking this equation, and this is equation 18 on the equation sheet, we can plug in our chamber temperature for T1 and the K that we got for our exhaust gas and determine our throat temperature. And again, the reason we wanna know temperature is because the more properties, the more intensive properties we know about these points, uh, that'll get us closer to finding this density value. So to find our throat temperature, we could solve this equation. And here, I have a function that does it quickly for us. We can see that at the throat, our temperature is 3000 Kelvin. So this makes sense, right? We started at 3400 Kelvin in the chamber. Remember, as we speed up, as the gases speed up, they're losing temperature. Uh, we're exchanging heat energy for kinetic energy. So this loss from 3400 to 3000 at the throat makes sense. And it's going to continue to decrease um, as it goes down the nozzle. So now that we know the throat temperature, we can find the throat velocity. Remember, at the throat, we're at Mach 1. Uh, Mach 1 is the local speed of sound. And this is the equation, equation 12 on the sheet, for the local speed of sound. And so we know K, we know R, these are properties of our exhaust gas. And now that we know the temperature at the throat from the previous step, we can find our throat velocity. So solving this equation, we get 1100 meters per second. Um, so I'll actually cross out what we know. So we've just found our throat velocity and we found our throat temperature. And so you can see we're at 1150 meters per second approximately. And this marks a huge increase in kinetic energy from the beginning. Uh, so if you assume that we start at zero, the throat um, after this converging section, we're speeding up a lot to Mach 1. And so once we reach Mach 1 speed of sound, it makes sense that our velocity is very high and it's gonna continue to increase past Mach 1, uh, past the nozzle. So the next thing we can find is our exit velocity. We already have all the inputs for this. Um, we have the properties of our gas, we have our chamber temperature and P2 and P0 here, uh, corresponding to the chamber pressure. And um, so P2 in this situation is our nozzle exit, might be confusing with this diagram, but P2 in this equation is the exit pressure. So we know all of this stuff just from our initial inputs and we can solve for the exit velocity. So this equation nine, again, this Python function is just simplifying the process of calculating this. And you can see I'm inputting all these initial, uh, all these parameters from our initial um, design parameters. And solving that, we see that our exit velocity is around 2,600 meters per second. So again, our gas is continuing to speed up from the throat where it was 1,150 meters per second, speeds up through the nozzle uh, to the maximum speed of 2,600 at the exit. Remember, we need the highest velocity possible. More velocity is more thrust. And so it makes sense that we get such a high velocity at the exit. So now we know the nozzle exit velocity. So we're one step closer to finding that area using the mass flow rate and the density. So now we can find our mass flow rate, right? We know what the nozzle exit velocity is and we know what our desired thrust is. So for using the ideally expanded case, we can solve for this mass flow rate. Um, so solving for M dot in this thrust equation, equation eight in the equation sheet, we can find our mass flow rate through the entire engine because mass is conserved and therefore is the same everywhere. And we get a mass flow rate of 5.8 kilograms per second. So this is the total mass flow rate, the mass flow rate of our oxidizer plus the max mass flow rate of our fuel, giving us a total mass flow rate of 5.8 kilograms per second. So using our OF ratio, if you wanted to, you can solve for the individual propellant mass flow rates. Um, so because we have more oxidizer per fuel, um, most of this total flow rate will be the LOX mass flow rate. But that's just a side point. So the total mass flow rate is 5.8. Great, so now we have this mass flow rate and that brings us one step closer to finding this area, right? Now we just need densities at these different points uh, and we can solve for the area. So speaking of densities, we're gonna find the specific volume. Remember specific volume is just the reciprocal of density. And at the nozzle entrance, so that that's around here, like right here, the nozzle inlet, we can use our ideal gas law to find the specific volume. 
Remember, we know what our chamber pressure is. Um, we can approximate the inlet pressure to be the chamber pressure. We know what um, our temperature is, because this is just our combustion temperature. And so we know two intensive properties. Remember, with the ideal, ideal gas law, we can find the third. And so we'll do just that by plugging in our chamber pressure, our chamber temperature, the gas constant for our exhaust gases. And with this, we can find our specific volume. And so we'll see that our specific volume at the nozzle entrance is around 0 0.44 meters cubed per kilogram. Cool, so now we know that cross that out the density effectively the same thing next thing we'll find is the specific volume at the throat and so remember there's a specific equation for this uh, this is equation 20 on the equation sheet for a specific volume and it takes in the specific volume at the nozzle inlet and our specific heat ratio and so we just found this specific volume at the inlet in the previous step we can plug that into this equation and we get our specific volume at the throat, which is gonna be a bit higher, and it's around 0 0.7 meters cubed per kilogram. So this means, what this means is that the density is decreasing as it expands um, in the nozzle, right? Specific volume increase means a density decrease, and this just makes sense with the notion of an expansion of gas, right? It's expanding eventually to this larger area. So our density is decreasing throughout the nozzle. Great, so now that we have this density, or specific volume, same thing. You can see that we have the density, we have our velocity and our mass flow rate. Uh, we're in a good spot to find the areas of these different points. The last thing we need is the exit um, density, the, the density of the gases at the exit. And so that's the next step. So to do this, we can use our isentropic relations. Remember, isentropic relations relate properties at two different points. So if you know the temperature at two different points, and you know the pressure or the density at one of those points, you can find the pressure and density at that other point using these relations. And so what do we know? We know our temperature in the chamber, or sorry, we know our pressure in the chamber, and we know our pressure at the exit, uh, right? These are things we set at the beginning, some of our design parameters. And so because we know this ratio, the pressure, um, in the chamber and at the exit, and we know the specific volume in our chamber, which we calculated in the previous step, we can find the specific volume at that second point, which in this case is the exit. And that's exactly what we need. So using the isentropic relations, um, definitely recommend trying to work this out on your own or convincing yourself how this works. We can solve for this specific volume uh, at the nozzle exit, and it's gonna be nine point four eight meters cubed um, per kilogram. So again, this huge increase in specific volume from the throat where it was 0 0.7 all the way to the exit where it's much higher. Again, this corresponds to a decrease in density. And so this area is much smaller. It's expanding in the nozzle. So we're getting an expansion process, a decrease in density. And this makes sense. So we know the density at the exit now. Now we have everything, right? We have our mass flow rate, we have our velocities, we have our densities. We can now use this equation to solve for our various different areas. So this is equation seven, and we'll start with the throat area, right? We know our mass flow rate, it's the same everywhere. We know our um, specific volume at the throat. We know our velocity at the throat, that was one of the first steps. Uh, and so using the mass flow rate equation, we can solve for the throat area. And so here we get our throat area. I've also outputted the throat diameter in inches and meters. So if you think about this, this is a throat diameter of 2.66 inches approximately. So this is where you start to get a sense of how big this engine is gonna be. Um, we have our throat diameter um, and that's gonna be 2.6 inches. And so let's see what the other areas are. So the nozzle exit area, same thing, same equation. This time we're using our density at the exit and our velocity at the exit, both of which we've calculated in previous steps. So plugging those numbers in to this mass flow rate equation, we get that our nozzle area is this number, nozzle diameter is this 6.5 inches larger number. And so, yeah, I mean, that kind of makes sense with this drawing, right? You have 
2.6 inches at this throat. Uh, with, as it expands, we get a larger diameter at the exit. Um, so one more thing before we figure out the chamber area, uh, there's a, we need to figure out what the volume should be, what the length is. Um, there's different ways because we can, by decreasing this length of the chamber, we can, for the same volume, increase the air, cross-sectional area. So that's another step, uh, and we'll do that next. But you can see through this process, we found the area of our nozzle, essentially. We found the area of the throat, of the exit, and um, this is, from this, we can figure out the area uh, of our chamber. And now that we have areas, we have a good idea of how big our engine is. Uh, and we'll see how we can connect these areas with the best lines or the best curves to optimize our performance. You can see how starting with a few of these initial parameters and using the equations to find the other properties at different points, we can then solve for our areas and effectively get an understanding of what our engine is going to look like, the shape and size. For that reason, this process is called sizing the engine or sizing the nozzle. And so next we'll see how we can actually size the chamber based off the sizes we found for our throat and our nozzle exit. Okay, so now that we've sized our nozzle, the last step to figuring out the overall shape and size of our engine is to size the chamber, the actual combustion chamber. And so the reason we can't do this using the same method we used for sizing the nozzle, using that mass flow rate and velocity and density, um, is because we made the assumption that our chamber is kind of constant throughout, right? The velocity, uh, we don't really have a velocity number associated with it. Uh, we're not really assuming the density is changing. We were assuming that at the nozzle inlet, uh, the conditions are the same at the beginning of the chamber. And so because of this assumption, we have to use a different method for actually sizing the chamber. And so an important characteristic for sizing chamber, uh, the combustion chamber, is called the characteristic length of the chamber. Uh, this is L star here. So L star is defined as the volume of the chamber divided by the area of the throat. And so another way to think about this is the length that the combustion chamber would have if the if it didn't expand, right? If the, if the area of the chamber was the area of the throat. So you can think about the throat and just a cylinder expanding from the throat, how long would that cylinder be? And so this is actually something that's tabulated or has been experimentally determined for different propellant combinations. And so you can see uh, in a table like this, for different propellant combinations, it has been determined what this characteristic length should be. And so this length is kind of based on what the size of the chamber should be in order for complete combustion to occur. Uh, and so people have tried different combustion chamber sizes or characteristic lengths, right? So I mean, it all comes down to uh, this number right here, because you could have a different cross-sectional area uh, for the same volume, and that'll change the length. And so they have figured out the, this characteristic length value for different combinations. Uh, and so if you're, depending on your combination, you want to look up what it, the nominal value is. And so actually for LOX propane, it is between 70 and 100 centimeters. Um, technically, it's a bit higher, but you can usually trade off some efficiency of your combustion reaction for some mass savings, right? Like the smaller this uh, character, the smaller characteristic length that you end up using for your chamber size, it means your chamber will be smaller, you're saving a little bit of mass, uh, and just overall size of your rocket. Maybe you're losing a bit of efficiency, maybe the combustion reaction is not 100% occurring, um, but usually trade-off trade -off is fine. So what we'll do is use the lower end of this range, around 70 centimeters for our characteristic length. And you can see we have the throat area from our previous uh, step of figuring out the nozzle areas. Uh, and we have this L star value now, and so we can solve for the volume of the chamber. And so doing that, we get a chamber volume of 0 0.0025 meters cubed. Uh, and so now that we have a volume, we can figure out our area, the cross-sectional area of the combustion chamber. And so an important number for that is this number three right here. And this is called the contraction ratio. And so this is the ratio of the chamber area to the throat area. Um, so take a moment to think about what that really represents. Uh, and so, again, this is something that has been experiment experimentally determined. People have you know, messed with different um, 
contraction ratios. And essentially the rule of thumb is that you want a contraction ratio of at least three. Um, so three, anything three and higher, you'll, you will get um, proper combustion, a proper combustion reaction uh, and a proper speeding up of your gas into the throat. Uh, if you use less than three, then you might not get a good reaction. So at least three, we'll be using three here just to keep our chamber area not too large. And so we can find the area this way by multiplying the throat area, which again, we determined before uh, by our contraction ratio of three, we get this number. And so now that we have the volume and we have the area, we can determine the length as well, right? It's just a cylinder. So the volume equals the area, cross-sectional area times the length. And so with two of these, we figure out the length and it's gonna come out to 0 0.23 meters. So now that we have all these dimensions, we'll see how we can throw them together uh, into a CAD software and actually put together our chamber and uh, finally get a visual on what our chamber and nozzle, what our whole engine looks like with all these sizes that we've determined. All right, here we are. This is the final step. Let's wrap up everything we've done so far and actually build up our engine in CAD software. Uh, so let's see what this looks like, a visual representation of all these random area numbers we look, we've developed up to this point. And so what I've done here is pulled up Onshape. This is the CAD software that I'll be using. We can really use any CAD software to accomplish the same thing in probably the same way. Uh, so there's SolidWorks, there's Inventor, there's plenty out there. Uh, and again, you'll be able to do the same thing in the same way. So our approach here, if you look at this bottom line, this long construction line at the bottom, you can think of that as the center line of the engine. And so what we'll do is build up the side profile of the engine and then revolve it around this center line to get that full three-dimensional um, engine. And so what these lines are, what these other lines are, correspond to the radii of those various areas that we've calculated up to this point. So the two left lines here correspond to the radius of the combustion chamber. And then the one in the middle is the radius of the throat. And all the way on the right here is the radius of our nozzle exit. And so what we're trying to do, what our task is really here is to connect these various points um, in the best way and then get that full shape uh, as one area and revolve it around this center line. So let's start at the left, very simple uh, to connect the beginning and end of our combustion chamber. Remember the combustion chamber is kind of just a cylinder and so we can just use a straight line to connect these two. And then we'll give that line the length of the combustion chamber that we calculated, which was around nine inches. Cool, so that'll make, that'll make up our combustion chamber. The next thing is to connect our, the end of the combustion chamber, otherwise known as the nozzle inlet, with the actual throat. And so I don't have too good of an answer here. Um, I think at the amateur level, it doesn't really matter too much how you do this. I'm sure there's some more literature about uh, the optimal way to do this if you're really trying to squeeze out every last bit of efficiency um, out of your engine. But at the amateur level, it doesn't really matter too much how you do this. You just wanna make sure that the nozzle inlet and the throat are not too close together or too far apart, right? That would just be a waste of mass. And so we can choose some distance, um, something like this, and then just connect these two dots uh, with a line. And so this will form the converging section of our nozzle, right? Where the gas speeds up uh, to the throat and reaches Mach 1 at the throat. And so the final line we have to make is the connection between the throat and the nozzle exit. And so this is, more non-trivial than the converging section. The di diverging section does matter how you do it. Uh, and so at a high level, there's two different approaches to um, the diverging section of the nozzle. You can either make a conical nozzle by connecting these two with a straight line, which is what we'll do. And so this is much simpler uh, in the design process, and but in exchange, it's a little bit less efficient. And so the other option, uh, instead of doing a straight line, would be more of a parabolic line and that'll give you a bell-shaped nozzle. And so the reason a bell-shaped nozzle is slightly better than a um, conical nozzle is that by the time your gas reaches the end of the nozzle with a bell shape, um, all the gas will be directed straight outwards. Whereas with a conical nozzle, which we'll see in a second, because it's constantly expanding, uh, because the gas is constantly moving in some upwards direction, or at least at an angle with some Y um, component in the upwards direction, by the time you, it leaves the exit or the nozzle exit, um, there's a little bit of momentum in the Y direction going up. And remember, we don't want that. We want all of our kinetic energy to be 
parallel to this line at the bottom, going out the bottom of the nozzle. Uh, and so you lose a tiny bit of efficiency there, but it's not too much. So at the amateur level, we can just um, skip the harder design process of doing a bell-shaped nozzle and just do a conical one. So for the case of this example, we'll make a conical nozzle, but you'll see that if we use RPA, RPA will actually tell us um, the, or give us the optimal nozzle contour, uh, which will be that bell-shaped curve, and we'll see that in a sec. But for this case, we'll just do a straight line. And so what I'll do is connect these two with a straight line. And so what matters here is the actual angle of this line. And so rule of thumb for conical shaped nozzles is that the angle you want is gonna be between 12 and 18 degrees. So people have done a lot of experiments and they found that between 12 and 18 degrees uh, for this particular angle is the optimal angle for a conical nozzle. And so what we'll do here is choose a number in between. We'll choose 15 and constrain this angle uh, this is called the divergence cone half angle and we'll constrain it to be 15 degrees and so you can see by constraining that to 15 degrees uh, it'll place the line exactly where it needs to be so cool now that we've connected every line uh, what we'll do is give our engine some thickness um, and so kind of arbitrarily right now i'll choose something around 0 .0 0 0.25 around a quarter inch of thickness um, and so this should not be a construction line, but an actual line. And so again, you'll put more thought into this, uh, into the thickness of the chamber when you're actually making the final design for manufacturing. But for the sake of just getting a visual representation of our engine, we'll just give it some arbitrary thickness and kind of just rapidly sketch it out all the way to the end. And so what I'm doing here is giving the our engine a, a thickness and creating that outer shell of the nozzle and combustion chamber great so you see that now we have a air an area a full fully defined area uh, that's shaded here and this is the area that will revolve around the axis to get our full engine so that's what i'll do next this sketch is complete and now what we'll do is actually revolve this area uh, so we can choose this area this face and then our revolution axis will be this line the center of our engine you can see by doing that there you go we can see our engine um, so pretty cool to see this after all the math we've done um, to actually get a visual representation that's not just random area numbers uh, and see what our final final design will pretty much look like um, again so more thought will definitely go into how you do this thickness um, other features in the nozzle and chamber maybe for cooling, et cetera, things like that. But um, this is a good thing, good exercise to do to just get a visual. What is our engine gonna look like? Um, just get a rough idea. And if you're, if you're building a full rocket, you're gonna want some kind of placeholder uh, pretty early on to size things in general. And so again, the design process is not complete here. You still need to figure out how it's gonna connect to your injector, uh, connect to the rest of the rocket, how you're gonna cool it but we can get a pretty good idea early on in the design process of what our engine is gonna look like. And so it's pretty cool. All right, so now what we'll do is perform the same set of steps, but in RPA to see how a tool like this can really simplify the process of doing all these calculations. And so RPA is a Windows only application, which means I have to record this, um, pre-record this, and now I'm talking over it. So bear with me here. Uh, but what we're doing is we're starting an engine and then essentially we'll run through the same set of steps. So we can set the chamber pressure. That's something we have to constrain at the beginning uh, of the manual process. And then we're also gonna constrain our nominal thrust. Uh, and so we set our chamber pressure to 400. Here you can uh, choose what to constrain. We're gonna choose our thrust right here, uh, 15 kilonewtons. And then we can choose what pressure it's gonna be optimized for. Remember we chose um, about 10 PSI. And so that's approximately 0.8 atmospheres. So the next step is to choose our propellants. Uh, that's the next kind of tab here and what i'm doing here is actually choosing the oxidizer from this long list of options that they have i don't know why i didn't show up in the recording but essentially i'm just scrolling through that list and choosing liquid oxygen as our oxidizer uh, you can choose more than one any combination of propellants uh, that's kind of the core of this application is like uh, solving the actual combustion process because um, it gets pretty nuanced in for depending on the conditions so here i'm choosing the fuel as well uh, choosing the propane so very simple, just two propellants, and then we're gonna choose our OF, and we said 2.7 was the maximum. What you could do here is iterate over different OFs to find um, what comes out to the best and then choose that. 
And so final thing, we have to choose our exit condition. Um, and so we're gonna choose, again, that 0.8 atmospheres corresponds to approximately 10 PSI, uh, which is what we calculated to, to use. And you can see there's plenty of other options here, um, but if you just run that, you can already get the size of your engine. So that's what this is. It's giving us all the different dimensions. Uh, and so if you wanted to, you can use this diagram with all the dimensions listed to actually create your nozzle. Uh, but we'll see after that you can actually export it as well. And so here you can see it's telling us these different properties, plenty of different properties on top of the ones that we've been talking a lot about. There's others uh, like the velocity, Mach number, things like that at the different points that we were talking about. So you can see injector is the beginning of the chamber. Nozzle inlet is the uh, end of the chamber. Then you have throat and exit. Uh, so it's telling, giving you a lot of information about these different points. What it also gives you is the breakdown of these different com uh, product gases, right? Uh, I told you like when we don't use a stoichiometric ratio, it gets pretty complicated. And this really tells you, uh, gives you a good breakdown of what's actually present in your chamber. You can see there's these other tabs with a lot of other information, a uh, really great tool. Uh, definitely recommend like just messing around with this. Um, but you can see the core aspects are, is this right here, the thermodynamic properties, thermodynamic properties of different points and the combustion stuff. Uh, and so again, we can, you can see the total mass flow right here was 5.7. Uh, and that's, a, that's very close to what we calculated manually. Uh, so the manual process gives you something very close. Uh, there are a few things that are a bit different just because this is more optimized for accounting for different nuances. Um, but yeah, and so what you can do at the end is export the contour instead of having to you know, use these numbers. Um, and so again, this tab also got hidden, but what happens is you can export a DXF and a DXF is a file uh, that you can then import into our CAD software and just uh, directly revolve that around that axis and you'll get um, the bell-shaped contour. So, I mean, it's pretty nice. Um, that gives you the more optimal engine size um, as opposed to that conical one we did. So it gives you the, the, uh, the bell contour based off um, a lot of these calculations that it's doing behind the scenes. And um, yeah, I mean, RPA is a great tool for this, these engine calculations. Uh, so I definitely recommend looking at it for yourself. There's a free version. Um, it gives you all the same capabilities, but you can only run three different uh, calculations before you have to restart. Um, but yeah, this is RPA. Uh, definitely recommend, again, messing around with it by yourself. Uh, see what kind of outputs it has. But at a high level, you can see how quickly just in a few minutes, we did every all the same steps that we did in the past uh, 10 minutes or more um, manually. Okay, so that's pretty much everything for the actual sizing of our rocket engine nozzle and combustion chamber. So you've seen how you can do it by hand using the calculations directly, and you've seen how you can use a tool like RPA to do a lot of the work for you. And so even with these tools, it's still good to know what's going on under the hood so that when you are iterating through different designs, you know what numbers affect the overall shape and size of our the rocket engine. And so this video was mainly focused on sizing the rocket engine. Uh, nevertheless, there's still many other considerations that go into the overall rocket engine design process, um, especially if your engine is gonna eventually fly in a rocket, there's gonna be other considerations that are coupled into the sizing of the rocket engine. And so what I wanna do before ending this video is briefly go over some of these other considerations and so, I mean, these other factors can be entire hour, multi-hour long videos in and of themselves, but to keep this video brief, we'll just go through high level, a high level overview of these different considerations. So kind of the main consideration that we've neglected throughout this video is the actual cooling of our rocket engine, right? If you remember back to the nozzle expansion section, we said that the, we can consider the flow to be isentropic, meaning there's no heat transfer to the surroundings. And so the isentropic assumption is good for considering the expansion of gas throughout the nozzle using a conservation of energy, but it's bad when considering cooling. So what this means is that there's not enough heat leaving our system for it to affect the overall expansion process, at least in the design process, but there is enough just raw heat transferring into the walls of our chamber for it to be something, uh, a problem to consider and to work around. So to put this into context, we have this little, think of this as a section of the chamber, uh, you know, metal chamber with the actual combustion happening on the other side. And so here we have the chamber in direct contact with our combustion, with our hot combustion in the combustion chamber. And so typically metals have melting points between 850 and 1800 Kelvin. Uh, and so 850 would be for aluminum. Aluminum has a very low melting point, but it's a light metal. So it's very good for 
um, systems that are gonna fly. And so what you'll notice here is that the range of the melting points of these metals is in general much lower than the combustion temperature um, for many different propellant combinations for all these reactions. And so because of this, we need to consider how we're gonna cool the wall of our combustion chamber and of our throat and even of our nozzle. So what, remember, like once you get to the nozzle, the chamber or the temperature is a bit lower uh, as we exchange heat energy for kinetic energy. So the hottest point is gonna be the actual combustion chamber. Um, but the, the section of the highest heat flux is actually the throat. So the throat has lower temperature, but much higher heat flux. So the throat is gonna be the part that heats up faster just because it's the smallest area. And so we need to do something about this. We can't just leave it in direct contact, especially if we're gonna be burning for a long time. And so the equation we're really interested in here is the equation for the convective heat transfer coefficient. And so that is what this number is. It's in watts per meter squared Kelvin. And you can determine this number based off various properties of our gases in the combustion chamber. So D here is the diameter of the combustion chamber. K is the conductive heat transfer coefficient of our gas. You can figure this out with RPA. It's one of those outputs that it tells you um, once you run the analysis. Um, so is the viscosity. Viscosity you could also find from our from RPA or the some other solver, chemical equilibrium solver. Density of the gas. Uh, the velocity is an important one, and this we can remember. We have plenty of equations for figuring this out at different points. Uh, it's related to the Mach number, especially, and then our specific heat, a constant pressure of the combustion gas, also something that is outputted by RPA. So you plug all these things in, you can find your heat transfer coefficient, convective heat transfer. And if you plug that into the actual heat equation, convective for convective heat transfer, uh, which you can look up, um, this is an important coefficient for determining essentially how much heat is going to be transferred from the combustion chamber into the wall of the, um, of the chamber. And so how much heat is being transferred will essentially tell you uh, what temperature it's gonna reach after what amount of time. And so all of these things are wrapped into um, some heat transfer analyses. Uh, you can use tools like an, um, ANSYS, which does this type of simulation for you. You would apply some kind of heat, um, you would apply a convective heat transfer coefficient at some surface and uh, you can simulate how hot the chamber is going to get. Um, so this is an important number and there's more to this. And um, so actually uh, Sutton's book, um, Rocket Propulsion Element, has a good chapter on heat transfer and I've linked that book, a PDF to the book in the um, description. So definitely recommend taking a look at that. So at a high level, different approaches to cooling um, vary. Uh, and so the simplest form, and this is actually what we use here at SEB, is ablative cooling. And so what this means is that you have your wall, you have your combustion, gases, and in between the two, you can just put some kind of material, uh, some ablative material. And usually this is some kind of phenolic resin. Um, and what it does, what this material will do is actually take the heat away with it. Um, and so as it gets hot, it'll kind of flake away and just remove the heat with it, just move with the combustion gas and leave the nozzle. And so this thing will actually get thinner as your burn increases in length. Uh, but the idea is that you do the math, you'll see and you'll add some margins, make this layer of ablative thick enough such that it can survive the entire burn. And ideally just for like some kind of, for mass optimization, it would be exactly thick enough such that when the burn is over, uh, you barely have any of it left. But this is the simplest method. Um, it's just a matter of replacing it every time you wanna use the engine again. Another type of cooling is film cooling. So this is actually where you inject a higher amount of fuel uh, towards the outer radius of the combustion chamber. So remember fuel, the ox more oxygen, more oxidizer is a hotter reaction. And so if you kind of drown the edge out with more fuel, um, your combustion won't be as hot on the edges. And so it'll be cooler. Um, towards the edges, which is represented by this yellow color here. So usually this isn't enough to cool the engine properly by itself. And so usually what you'll see is uh, film cooling paired up with some other type of cooling. But uh, this is usually pretty effective at bringing down the temperature at the surface of the combustion chamber, the inner surface. 
but usually not enough to fully cool your engine, especially if you're burning for a long time. And so the third type of cooling, this is most often used in industry uh, because it is the most effective solution, uh, most efficient when it comes down to it, is regenerative cooling. And so look at this diagram, what you have is you have your chamber, your chamber wall, and it is in direct contact with the combustion gases. But what you have on the other side of the wall is your propellant, one of our propellants. And so instead of injecting the propellant straight into the combustion chamber, what you'll do is flow either your fuel or your oxidizer, it's usually the fuel, in this channel and these small channels around the outside of the chamber uh, or between these two walls of the chamber through the engine and then back up into the injector to inject it into the combustion chamber. And so by doing this, this propellant will absorb some of the heat, a lot of the heat actually, of this reaction uh, and essentially keep the wall at some equilibrium temperature that is below its melting point. And so by having this cold propellant absorb a lot of this heat, you can actually maintain a relatively low temperature in this wall, despite it being exposed directly to the hot gases. Another very important consideration is the actual injector design. So the job of the injector is to take in both of your propellants and inject them into the combustion chamber, right? We talk about this reaction occurring in the combustion chamber. Well, how does, how do the propellants even get there? And it's by going through the injector. And so the point of the injector is really to maximize the surface area to volume ratio of our propellant mixture. And so that's kind of what you see in this picture here. We're slamming these streams of propellant together to get these small droplets. And that process is called atomizing the propellants. And what you want to do is atomize the propellants, get these tiny droplets, essentially form a mist with uh, these streams of propellant so that we can most effectively initialize the combustion reaction. And so the smaller your droplets are, the more efficient the combustion reaction is going to be. And so that's, a, that's kind of the point of the injector. And so there's different designs to accomplish this. Uh, this is our injector at SEB actually, and we use what's called a pintle injector. And so what you have is one of the propellants coming out radially from this pintle section. You can see from these 24 holes, there would be streams of liquid oxygen coming outwards. And out of this annulus uh, right here, this small crevice around the pintle, uh, we have propane coming out, um, which is our fuel. And so what happens is we have uh, our oxidizer coming in radially, and then our fuel coming in down, straight down, and by slamming into each other, we get a nice cone uh, of mist. And that's what we're igniting to initialize the combustion reaction. Another very common design, not too complicated, is an impinging injector. And this is just forming holes that kind of aim at each other. And you can see that here, such that when you flow your propellant through them, the, the streams slam into each other. And again, you get that atomization occurring. So you're taking a stream and converting it to a bunch of smaller droplets that we can then ignite. Another type is a coaxial swirl injector. And so what's happening here is that you are introducing the propellant into this little chamber right here at an angle such that they swirl together and mix in this little section. Um, and so what you get is, again, this mist with one propellant coming in through here uh, and the other one coming out, coming in through this other section, I believe. And so together, when they swirl together, they form this mist, uh, this atomized mist right here. So all these essentially are trying to accomplish the same thing. There's different methods to do it. You have to consider what your machining capabilities are. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the main thing. Like, what are you able to actually make? What's gonna be the easiest for you to make? Um, and achieve the smallest droplets possible. And so the governing equation here, very important equation is this one. And this is gonna determine the mass flow rate of the propellant through your injector as a function of the area and then the density of the propellant and the pressure differential across that your injector. And so that's the pressure at the injector minus the pressure in the chamber. And so remember like, the total mass flow rate is something that was determined when we were designing our engine. And so once you know the total mass flow rate, you have your OF ratio, you can figure out the individual mass flow rates of both propellants. You're going to want to design your injector around um, or to design the injector to be able to produce this mass flow rate for a given chamber pressure, which is also something we can const constrained 
and you want to make sure that your feed system can supply the um, the pressure upstream of the injector or of the chamber at the injector. So what this means is that the pressure at the injector is always going to be higher than the pressure in the chamber. So whatever your chamber pressure is, you need to ma make sure your feed system and the pressure at the injector is higher than that chamber pressure. And f based on this difference, you can design your injector area to supply the mass flow rate that you need to in order to um, reach the design parameters that you've determined your engine needs. And that's something we did in the, in the design process. This last number here, CD, is the discharge coefficient. And so this is just a ratio of the ideal mass flow rate to, or the actual mass flow rate to the ideal mass flow rate through this area. And so in, if your injector was perfect and you got the full mass flow rate possible uh, given the area, pressure, and density, then the CD would be one. And so this is kind of a property of the geometry of that injector element of these orifice areas. And um, you can kind of do your own testing to figure out what your particular CD is, but to get rough numbers, there, there are tables like this. And this is out of that book again, Rocket Propulsion Elements. And so for different types of orifice areas, you can get um, a rough idea of what the discharge coefficient will be and plug that into the equation. So going back to our pintle injector, this is something we have to figure out for our pintle cap here, right? We have these little holes and we need to figure out what is the discharge coefficient um, of that pintle cap so that we can effectively figure out the mass flow rate. Um, and then also in the design process, what size, what total area um, should we have this injector come out to? Another important consideration is your feed system. So the question here is how are you getting the propellants from the propellant tanks down to the combustion chamber, to the injector? And so there's two approaches to this. Uh, a lot of smaller rockets at the amateur level use a pressurant fed system, pressure fed system, uh, and that's what we actually do. And so what you have here is a gas, uh, a high pressure gas at the top that's essentially pushing down on your propellants uh, so that they can make their way to the combustion chamber. And so this is a much simpler implementation than the other option, which is a pump fed system. So here you don't have a third tank with gas, but instead you are increasing the pressure downstream of the tanks with these pumps. And so there's different approaches to these pumps. You can either um, spin the pumps electrically with a motor, or you can have some external or some secondary combustion chamber that's essentially, that's essentially driving the pumps. Uh, for the propellants to make their way to the chamber. And so again, pressure fed is much simpler. This is what we use here at SEB. Uh, the, the main gases used for that are gaseous nitrogen and helium. Um, and so pump fed systems, I won't go into that. There, that can be a whole video in and of itself. Uh, Everyday Astronaut has a good video on different engine cycles um, that's worth watching. Pumps are really cool, but they're much more complex. And so here you have, this is Eureka 1, this is our rocket, and you can see that we use a pressure fed system, right? We have a tank at the very top, this is our pressure fed system, or this is our pressure tank, and it's pushing down on both of these propellant tanks. And so here's a simplified diagram of our system. So I've actually made a video on our plumbing system that I will link in the description. You could also just go to our channel and find that one. It's called Eureka 1 Plumbing Overview. Uh, and so there I'll go over the specific implementation that we've used for this entire feed system. So that's kind of describing everything that we did not describe in this video, everything upstream of the injector. And so real quick, just to bring it up, here is an example of a pump fed system. And so this is uh, one of SpaceX's Merlin engines. And this giant thing right here is essentially the pump. Uh, and so here's another render of a, tur of a turbo pump. Uh, and so again, what this is doing is increasing the pressure downstream of the tanks so that we get these high pressures at the injector and high pressures in the combustion chamber. So I mentioned this before, but you get you can get much higher pressures in your combustion chamber with a pump fed system because just the limiting factor that you reach with a, a pressure fed system. And so again, what you're trying to do here is achieve the highest pressure possible at the injector so that you can achieve a high pressure in the combustion chamber. And so the pressure you're able to reach at your injector with your fet, with your feed system is going to determine how you design your injector and then the eventually the size of your combustion chamber as well.
So the last consideration I want to talk about is the actual ignition process, right? How do you start this combustion reaction when the propellants are first entering your chamber? And so what you want to consider here is the timing of your ignition process with the flow of propellants into the chamber. And so you want it such that right when you first start flowing propellants into the chamber is when you ignite them. What happens if you wait too long? And this is something we did when we first started off. We kind of overlooked the ignition process here at Seb, and it actually cost, uh, cost us our entire chamber, right? It blew up because of this. And so what happened is if you, we waited a bit too long to start the ignition process, and what that does is it builds up too much propellant in the chamber such that when you do introduce that external source of energy to initialize the combustion process, there's just too much energy released at once. The pressure increases in your chamber too high and your feed system isn't able to keep up. And just that rapid release of energy all at once is can be dangerous and cause the chamber to essentially rupture and uh, you overpressurize it because of the just amount of energy you're releasing at once. Um, so again, what you want is your propellants to start flowing and your igniter to start uh, the combustion process as soon as it's exposed to the flow of propellants and you don't want to wait uh, too long. Um, another thing to think about is what you're actually using to, as this external source of energy to initialize the combustion reaction. What we use is a small solid motor. I believe it's a C-class motor. Uh, anything within that range kind of will probably work for this scale of an engine. And so we're around 1.3 uh, kilograms per second of total mass flow rate. And so depending on this total mass flow rate, you're going to have to scale up the essentially the size of that energy source to initialize the reaction, right? Like if we just used a small match, for example, um, that's probably not enough energy for the total mass flow rate that we have. And then the flame will just get burned out or um, drowned out by our um, propellants instead of actually starting the reaction. And so this is something you want to look into. How much energy does your reaction need based off of flow rates? Uh, and make sure you're supplying enough energy with your uh, source of ignition. Other people use like road flares or spark plugs. Uh, there's various different ways to approach this. Um, and again, here at Seb, we just use a small solid motor. And so the final thing with, with respect to the ignition, ignition sequence is the relative timing of LOX and fuel, um, of liquid oxygen and your fuel. And so what you want is for both the propellants to reach the chamber at around the same time. Um, and so what happens if you delay one with, this, with respect to the other, well, one, you're just wasting propellant, right? If you wait like three seconds before actually starting the flow of fuel, you're just wasting liquid oxygen. Um, and so the most efficient use of propellant is that it's all going to the combustion. But something else that could happen is if you flow fuel too early, then you might, again, cause what's called a hard start. Um, by the time you get the full combustion reaction with the oxidizer, uh, there's too much fuel built up inside the chamber and again, that can cause too much energy to be released at once. And so what you want, what you're really aiming for is for liquid, liquid oxygen and your fuel, or I guess in general, your oxidizer and your fuel to reach the chamber at the exact same time so that you're using all of your fuel, fuel for combustion and you're not building up, or you're not wasting any fuel or building up any fuel um, before you actually start the reaction. And so that's kind of what this, this is part of the data analysis we do. We're looking at our injector pressures to see the relative timing of liquid oxygen and fuel. And what we've implemented for safety reasons is a slight liquid oxygen lead. And that's what you can see here, right? At this point, uh, we start to see a rise in pressure in the injector for liquid oxygen. And then a few milliseconds later, I think around like 50 milliseconds later, um, we see the beginning of a fuel rise. Um, and so yeah, what we're doing here is slightly delaying the fuel uh, just so we can avoid the situation where we start with fuel, don't have oxygen yet, and um, potentially cause a hard start. And so again, just in, at a high level, what's important is the relative timing of your propellants at the injector, the type of it, your, your the type of igniter you're using. You got you want to make sure it's fixtured well, such that when the propellants start to flow, you're not shooting out your igniter uh, ignition source, and you want to make sure that you are igniting the propellants as soon as they reach the chamber and not some significant amount of time afterwards.
All right, that's pretty much it for this video. I just want to take this opportunity to mention that this video, these set of videos were meant as a high level introduction to a lot of these concepts. And so if you're going to be doing your own engine design, you definitely want to do a lot more research into the particular topics that I talked about, uh, especially the engine, the actual design process, right? Like what things to consider. Uh, I might have left some, left some stuff out, might have said things inaccurately. So definitely do your own research. And um, after all, this is rocket science, right? There's a lot of intricacies. There's a lot of complexities that go into this field. And so with that, I might have made some mistakes and I might have said things inaccurately. So definitely check the comments to see if people have corrected anything I've said in these videos. Uh, and if you've noticed that I made a mistake, please go ahead and comment that in the comments section so that other people can learn from that. But overall, I hope that with these videos, you can take something away. I hope you learned something about the high level design process. And I hope that with this video, um, it'll help you on your journey of designing your own rocket engine. So with that, I'll leave it at that. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys in the next one.